Let's get into the day's news and plenty of it that's around. Now, you would be pleased to know that we have a Prime Minister who feels our pain. Now, he doesn't do that with any of his actions, but, of course, he says it in speeches. He did so on Friday where he said, I feel your cost of living pain. And why wouldn't Anthony Albanese be the man who absolutely feels our pain? I mean, he's the guy who, of course, decided to increase petrol taxes to 49 cents per litre, refuses to cut it, because that, of course, would help people. He's the guy who took $1,500 out of the automatic tax return for 10 million voters in Australia. He's the man who feels the cost of living pain because he, along with every other person in our federal government, got the largest pay rise in 10 years on his watch. Plus, of course, he's a man who, who, who certainly feels that pain because this was a cost of living budget. And everyone knows this was a cost of living budget because I don't know about you, totally solved for me. Like 100% easy, like I was talking to the people here in parks, they've never had it better, swimming in cash just because of the greatest Prime Minister of all time. But, of course, he feels our pain and he feels for the little people because, remember, this budget that produced an average tax cut of about, what, $36 per worker per week, is getting not one but two private planes. That's the guy who understands cost of living when he's going to spend basically the same amount of money he piddled up against the wall on a yes-no question that only Albo could turn from 60-40 yes into 60-40 hell no. He said, well, that was last year. This year it should be $450 million and not one but two private planes. Now, again, just to show that he cares, he's part of the greatest Prime Minister of all time, speaking... Oh, sorry, I'm a bit emotional. On Friday. And I know that when you are living week to week, it's hard to even find the time to think about the future, let alone plan for it with confidence. I mean, he understands, right? He's got a private plane already, which he flies around and names after his dog. He understands what it's like because he got the pay rise along with everyone else. He understands what it's like because he's allowed to sell his investment properties because he just, you know, needs an extra $1.9 million. Jeez, it must be one hell of a wedding. But on top of that, of course, he understands our pain because I don't know if you know this about the Prime Minister. Did you know that he grew up in a single parent household and a housing... It, uh, unbelievable, right? He understands your pain. Now, of course... What is central to one of my many frustrations with this Prime Minister and why I constantly keep coming back to the cost of living is because he does know better, but he shows himself to be a person as if he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth, not a wooden spoon across his backside. He's a bloke who, of course, when he was in opposition, every single thing to do with cost of living was personal. It was the then Prime Minister and his government's fault. What we know is that under Scott Morrison cost of living is in crisis. We know that the price of everything is going up, but people's wages aren't. Scott Morrison, of course, is happy to always take re credit for anything that goes right. But he always says, it's not my job, it's someone else's fault, it's nothing to do with me when things aren't going so well. So, you see, cost of living is completely the Prime Minister's responsibility. Unless, of course, it's this Prime Minister. The Prime Minister blames the rising costs on two years of economic shocks and aftershocks which were caused by the pandemic, conflicts overseas and the most significant international energy crisis in half a century. Yeah, because idiots like you think we should blow up the power system that worked to replace it with the one that'll cost a trillion dollars to make and, fingers crossed, will work just as well as the previous one has. Now, of course, my frustration comes from the fact that this guy's promise couldn't have been clearer. How many times have I shown you this poster? Because I want every person who sees the show to remember what the promise was and test that against the reality of the past two years. Cost of living has got worse. It is not all the government's fault, but it wasn't all the government's fault last time. But I hold this bloke's feet to the fire because he set the standard by which he judged others and therefore he should be judged. And on that case, he fails very often. But, of course, this Prime Minister takes no responsibility for anything. So it won't surprise you that he had a conversation on a podcast, university podcast, where it's all Sky News' fault. 
It's all Sky News, 2GB, 3AW, it's all Paul Murray and it's all Ray Hadley's fault. You see, the Prime Minister expressed his frustration with unspecified newspapers, geez, I wonder what he's talking about, radio stations and TV commentators. Hi, Albo, glad you're watching. In an interview with the Australian National University podcast, I mean, this, the Prime Minister's got time to do student radio, but basically now it's a podcast, complaining particularly about the cost of the government's revamped tax cuts. Oh, yes, it is completely my fault. It is completely Sky News Primetime's fault. It is completely Ray Hadley's fault that when you told your Labor MPs that the tax cuts were a, and I quote, solution to cost of living, that while the rest of the media, that of course play games for access, don't want to upset the dear leader at all, well, those of us who couldn't give a tuppence whether he calls us or not or ignores us or even tries to threaten ever so passively aggressively our existence at times, that the reality of the tax cut was too little too late. Remember, even when they launched this thing, it was all about thousands of dollars at the end of the year, but the reality was you pay your tax per week. You pay your tax per fortnight. You pay your tax per month, which is why I've said since day one, too little too late. When your energy bill goes up by the amount that it has, when the petrol bill goes up, let alone everything else. Notice they never talk about insurance. Well, of course, that has also gone up by the best part of what? More than 20%. But too little, too late tax cuts. Well, if you earn just $45,000, it's 15 bucks a week. $60,000, 22 bucks a week. You've seen it how many times before? That's why I call it too little, too late, because even if you were somebody on the bones of their backside, you're not noticing 15 bucks. And it's just so patronising from the people who fly around in the private planes with millions of dollars worth of investment properties, and good luck to them, that's fine, don't have a problem with personal investment, but still. The people who get the biggest pay rise in 10 years, as well as the bureaucrats who get the biggest pay rise in 10 years, who turn around and they just think so generically poorly of you. But 36 bucks, a couple of crumbs, that'll be OK. P.S. Not one, but two near private planes for me. Anyway, the thin-skinned Prime Minister continues here. He thinks that uh, people like myself, Ray Hadley, people on 2GB, 3RW, 4BC and the rest of us here in Sky News Primetime are a cheer squad for Peter Dutton. This is because some of the transcripts that he reads when Peter Dutton does interviews with us, essentially, is him just saying, yes, I agree, because maybe he does agree with the premise of the question that he's just been asked. Not everything is to be put through the ringer of the ABC where they try to kind of fit you up as being a mini-Trump. Well, thankfully, of course, we have no evidence whatsoever of the Prime Minister or Labor Party leader agreeing with people when he's getting interviewed. The economic and budgetary circumstances have completely changed since the Stage 3 tax cuts were first announced. Well, the economic circumstances have changed, Laura. Is there actually scope for the government to prosecute an ambitious agenda in the face of it? There is. Albo's not very pleased because Labor remains strongly opposed to the plan, don't you, Albo? Well, we are opposed to the plan. I barely recognise... Do you know what a glow-up means? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> it's good to get out and about, isn't it? Yeah. Now, what he would prefer, that the role of the media is to say, everything is awesome, there's not a problem, every solution's incredible, P.S. can we help organise your bucks weekend? The reality is, is that there are, yes, those of us that didn't vote for him. Those of us who don't think that he is the second coming and those of us who also can see that sometimes the emperor doesn't have any clothes. And as unpleasant as that is to mentally think about, the reality is, just like most of the media was also critical and also personal last time, there are plenty of us who just want to use the same standards on this bloke. We continue. Albanese said that he considered long-form pieces in the newspapers as being far less frequent, and newspaper front pages tended to be gone tomorrow because there isn't any substance to it. Well, I hope that he read what Peter Credlin wrote today in the weekend newspapers because it was all about how the Prime Minister no longer deserves the benefit of the doubt. He is the Emperor with no clothes. As Peter writes, sadly, we now, we now see Albo for what he is, weak, not across the detail, greedy for the trappings of the job despite the suit, still ranging, hard left, still the raging hard left activist from his youth. All the stuff that we told you before the last election and we've been telling you every day since. And yes, we were mocked for doing so, but guess what? You could tell that this bloke was not going to be able to match up to the hype. But most of the media, of course, well, they go with the hype.
I told you last week about a great editorial that Chris Kenny did on this very subject here on our airwaves. He wrote a more detailed version, even in the uh, Australian newspaper, which is, what is the point of the Spectator Prime Minister? Anthony Albanese is shrinking before our eyes like an empty twisters, a twisties packet on a heater. Failing by his own criteria, running from his responsibilities, he's a dismi dim uh, diminished Prime Minister, unable or unwilling to exert whatever authority he can muster. And perhaps one thing that the Prime Minister needs to remember before he wants to blame the media who disagree with him as the reason why he is not having the greatest run. The reality of this bloke is that he was not elected by the majority of Australians. The Labor Party at the last election got one of the lowest votes it has got in decades. Just 32 and a bit percent of Australians actually voted for the Labor Party. Now, yes, preferences from the Greens and all the rest of it means they got to the place where they won two more seats than they needed to form a majority. But that is the reality of the electoral politics. The vast majority of people didn't vote for him. So surprise, surprise, if the vast majority of people from time to time may actually notice that he isn't that amazing. But, of course, rather than focus on the failings of the government, holding the government to account for its own failings, we know where most of the media is that likes the new arrangement of a Prime Minister who helps tuck them into bed at night by giving them interviews or sending them text messages about what's going to be happening tomorrow. Get Dutton. Let's pretend that... Peter Dutton is the single biggest problem in Australian politics, that he's mini-Trump, that he will divide us, that he will not respect the democracy, all the other crap that's been sent around for a while. Remember, this is a Prime Minister who's using taxpayers' money to do Labor Party work. And I'm not just talking about 100 or something million dollars worth of taxpayer advertising, flogging programs that you don't need to apply for. I'm talking about things like taxpayers paying for a dirt unit to be set up inside the Prime Minister's office to try and find things to get people to be scared about even having a conversation about Peter Dutton. But then every now and then, like all good lefties, the Prime Minister can't help us but show his Achilles heel. From time to time, he will lead with his chin and he doesn't realise that, of course, his jaw is glass. He's trying to pretend that the reason Peter Dutton will not get enough support to get anywhere near the Prime Ministership at the next election, meaning he can continue, that being Albo, to be exactly what he is and continue to fail because the other guys will never get over the teals, is that he's already trying to pretend that the next election is the last election. Same speech in between all of the other self-loathing and the podcast from the university. Essentially, Peter Dutton is Scott Morrison 2.0. Everything that you felt about ScoMo, everything you felt about that Liberal Party, you must automatically click and drag across to Peter Dutton because, of course, he was part of it. Now, I have a little warning for the Prime Minister and his political mates, whose job, it seems, at times is to hate watch this show to know how normal people are thinking. In 2019, the then Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, absolutely nailed the Labor Party. Remember the miracle victory that we all knew was on its way because we knew people weren't going to buy Bill Shorten and the policies. Well, by his own admission, one of the things, of course, that when you've won an election nobody expects you to do is to basically try to rerun the same logic at the next election. And how did that work out for him? It is always dangerous, it is always stupid when people think that the last election was the forever election and we just do the same thing again three years later. Now, yes, it's a first-term government. The likelihood is that they will end up in a minority government where idiots like the Greens and the Teals will end up with even more power. But the reality of... Voting in Australia right now is the Prime Minister is only just, and I mean just, in front when it comes to news poll, but he's behind on lots of other polls. The issues say that Australians don't trust what happened out of the budget and I think also we've all had enough of the gaslighting. We've had enough of the BS. We've had enough of being told that everything is awesome when it's harder than ever. Now, I also want to talk about something, which is be careful what you wish for. Be careful if you want to ban things and then the banning of things ends up being something completely different than what you're expecting. Now, the Prime Minister and the Communications Minister, Michelle Rowland, of course, they have formed because they right now are trying to censor the internet. They are trying to censor the internet by trying to essentially make it illegal for anyone to post, what is it they call uh, misinformation. 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 The misinformation which is there. Some misinformation. But, of course, the reality is that misinformation is judged by the people in power. 
The people in power told you one, through, one thing during COVID. It turned out to be exactly the opposite. We show you the data here each and every night so you can see where the opinion comes from. Yet the opinion is what they want to ban. So if you post things like the comments I make each and every night, well, you know what will happen. Some lefty think tank will say, that's misinformation because he didn't carry the one. Well, what ends up then happening, of course, is they turn around and eventually they just hound the social media companies until no longer will you be able to post things from the websites or the news services that the government doesn't like. Now, of course, that all is great for lefties now because they think it's all about the people they don't like. Well, imagine if it's another government and it's the media they like. 